good weekend and you're having a good first couple weeks of class. Uh, today, we're just going to continue to develop our knowledge of the topic of critical thinking and argument a little bit more. Um, so I'm going to start off by just kind of reviewing some of the main points that we all covered last week uh, at our Thursday meeting. And then we'll just transition from there into some new concepts for today as well. Um, the first homework assignment is not yet assigned, but I will give it to you guys on Thursday, and then you'll have a week to complete it from there. So just stay tuned, and I'll make sure to give you detailed directions, and I'll also post them to the Canvas page for our class so that you have them in your records. Um, but yeah, let me just get this started by asking you guys to do a little informal greeting for the first, I mean, if I ever want to have attendance records and stuff, that sometimes is useful. Plus, I like to just see your guys' names and get you to engage one time. So go ahead and say hello, good afternoon, whatever you want, um, and leave that comment in the chat or whatever real fast if you can. <laughs> okay, hi there, Hannah, Tom, Blake, how's it going? Jordan, Karen, Ali, Jacob, Stuart, Hannah, Daniel, AJ, Coy, Lorena, Nancy, Gunner, Daisy, Tim. <clears throat> Welcome back everyone, Guadalupe, Sawyer, Melissa, Lucas, Carly, Rayanne. All right, guys, I appreciate it. And everybody else that's here, thank you guys so much for uh, for making the class meetings um, happen. Okay, and we all know, of course, but I'll just remind you that next week is when we start the in-person, face-to-face part of our semester. So we have a couple of weeks lead in to get everybody prepared for that. But uh, as of next Tuesday, we'll be there on campus in the, um, well, you see the building and classroom listed in the syllabus. If you need that info, you can find it on Canvas. All right, <clears throat> so let's go back over a couple of important points, some of these things that we talked about on Thursday last week. Um, so we talked about how the whole point of the class is to become a good critical thinker. And we started off with just like a base description of what is a good critical thinker. So uh, let's see who can tell me that piece of info. Like, what did we say is a good critical thinker? What type of person is that? Type of person that what? You can let me know in the chat, Mike, whatever you prefer. <clears throat> I know it takes a moment. You know, we've had a weekend, so I just kind of want to take it slow, get us back up to speed. But let's try and go back in our minds, in our notes, or the book, or some combo of all three. What is it? Wasn't it somebody who they based, they judged other people's arguments and used their used reason in their own arguments so they wouldn't, like, take whatever somebody else says at face value. Yeah, well, basically, in, in, in a way, yes. A good critical thinker is the type of person that won't believe a claim unless it is based on good evidence or good arguments. So it has to be supported by good evidence and arguments to pass through the sort of filter of uh, rational skepticism that a good critical thinker has. So a good critical thinker demands on and insists on good evidence and arguments before they're willing to believe a claim. And as you said, when the good critical thinker makes claims to some other person or party, they're always able to provide the good evidence and arguments to support and back up their views and claims. So that's it. Good critical thinkers are both skilled at evaluating the quality of the uh, arguments and claims coming towards them, and they're also effective at producing high quality evidence and arguments to defend and uh, base their own views when they put them to others. Now, a bad critical thinker, we said, is just the opposite. That's the type of person that will believe things uh, that are not based on good evidence and arguments. Um, so people will believe things sometimes for no good reason, maybe because they hope they're true or because they wish they were true, um, or maybe because it's a f interesting or tantalizing possibility. But bad critical thinkers are those that they don't have that same kind of skeptical filter um, even information that's not based on any kind of good evidence will be believed. And also the bad critical thinker lacks the capacity to defend their own views when they're pressed by others to give a justification. So we want to be the better rather than the worst critical thinkers. We all talked about examples of people, either individual or types, who could fit the description of either category. Think like, you know, lawyers, doctors, judges, medical professionals um, on the good critical thinking side. Um, maybe children, um, cult members, um, religious fanatics, all kinds of other examples could be given to or it's bad critical thinkers of the world. Now, after that, we all kind of wanted to get clear on the topic and definition of the concept of an argument, because that's center stage on both descriptions of good and bad critical thinkers. Good critical thinkers are good at presenting arguments to defend their views, and they're also capable of examining incoming arguments to see whether they're based on good reasons. 
So what then is an argument in the formal sense that we've talked about here in, um, in critical thinking and logic? It's a set of things. It's a set of how many things and what are the parts called, if you could remember that. Definition of an argument. Let me know. <clears throat> it's a set of two or more sentences where one is the conclusion and all the others are premises. Yes, correct. So when you have an argument, you have a set of sentences. There's got to be at least two because every argument is a combination of a conclusion with at least one premise. Now, um, for example, <clears throat> a little more room, thank you. Jones has lipstick on his collar. Um, <clears throat> Jones um, did not come home last night. So suppose that somebody bases the conclusion that Jones is cheating off of these two, you know, premises. Jones is cheating on his wife. <clears throat> So, I mean, I'm just creating this totally off the top of my head, but just so we have some example to think about for the moment. In this argument, as you see, this is the conclusion that Jones is cheating on his wife, but it's not just a statement with no evidence provided. Uh, these are the premises. So in this example, we say Jones has lipstick on his collar and Jones did not come home last night. Therefore, Jones is cheating on his wife. Someone reaches that conclusion based on the set of premises that are given here. It could be an argument that, you know, um, of any kind, scientific arguments, moral arguments, arguments about policy. Somebody could make the case that affirmative action is a good um, policy for hiring and admissions because of, you know, give data, reasons A, B, and C. Another person can make a counter argument, say, no, this is not a wise policy to pursue, and they would give their reasons or evidence to the contrary. So arguments are the lifeblood of critical thinking and really philosophy and just reasoning in general. Um, so we just want to make sure that we're comfortable and familiar with the terminology used. So what is the conclusion of the argument again? Let's hear that just in more depth. The conclusion specifically is the sentence or statement that what? Just take a moment. I know it takes a second. but it, 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 you're, um, you're trying to prove to be true. Yes, it is the sentence that you're trying to prove to be true. And the premises, what is their role? Support the argument. Yeah, well, the conclusion, yes. So they're the support, the evidence that provides backing for the conclusion. In this case, that's the evidence given to generate support for the conclusion that Jones is cheating. Um, notice that one sentence by itself is not an argument. So if we just say um, affirmative action is bad, well, that's not an argument. It may be a reasonable conclusion for some argument, but it has to be justified with reason. Otherwise, it's just a statement or an assertion, but it doesn't have any kind of support. Okay, now, we said that the whole point behind making such arguments is to convince people, maybe even just ourselves, that a conclusion is true. So now let us return to that concept again. What does it mean for a sentence to be true? What is it that? is it reality. Well, yeah, well, it matches the facts of reality. Whatever the sentence says mirrors the facts. Somebody tell me something true. I have my snake around my neck. Oh, really? Who is that? Carly? Oh, okay. Her name's Mocha. She's oh. super sweet. Oh, that is cool. I had no idea. I couldn't see. Now I can see it. Yeah, okay. So there, that's yeah. a true fact. You do have the snake around your neck. True. It's a fact. So um, if you had said something else, like, I don't know, there is a, um, let me think of a different animal, an ostrich in the bedroom there, that would have been false uh, because that doesn't match what's real. But yes, you have an interesting true statement to report, which is that you do have that snake right there, as we can see on the camera. So anyway, statements, they're not always true. It depends on whether they match the facts. Um, when a statement does match the fact, it's true, otherwise false. Now, next question, what's a belief? When a person thinks that the statement is true. Yes, when a person thinks that the statement is true, when they themselves agree with it, accept it, and so forth. So um, beliefs can vary from person to person. If you have one person believing uh, that the earth is round, 
and another person who says, I don't think it's round, they're a flat earther, then the one proposition that it is round, they differ on it. One says, I think that's the fact. The other doesn't think that's the real fact. So they don't have the same beliefs. Beliefs, as we've said, are subjective because it depends on the individual's point of view or judgment on what the facts are. But after all, there is only one set of objective facts. So when two people don't agree on the shape of a planet, they can't both be correct. Another example, if Smith and Jones um, disagree about whether uh, Bill is the killer, they can't both be correct. It can't be that Jones and Smith are both right. Bill is the killer. Also, he's not the killer. If, uh, if Samantha and Melissa disagree about whether their friend Jessica is pregnant, they can't both be correct. She can't both be pregnant and also not at one and the same time. So when it comes to propositions, they have what are called truth values. They either match the facts or they don't, but they can never do both at once. Nonetheless, people can have different beliefs at the same time, and just one of them in that case at most is correct. Okay, so we say truth when the proposition statement matches the facts. Belief when you think it does. Um, now, we talked, I think, also about different types of sentences, right? So one type of sentence are the assertoric sentences. Those sometimes are called declarative sentences. Um, in the, let me see, the transcript there, it's writing the word assertoric as <laughs> astrotoric, esoteric, just so you know, it's not getting the proper word out, but it's this, assertoric slash declarative. Anyway, declarative or assertoric sentences are sentences that are either true or false. So like saying that um, Biden is the president, that's a true assertion. Saying that Hillary Clinton is the president is a false assertion. So, I mean, they're both claims, but one matches what's real and one doesn't. Okay. What's another type of sentence? Anybody remember another category? Interrogative. Correct. Yeah. Interrogative sentences are what, in other words? Questions. They are questions. Correct. So if I ask you, what's an interrogative? That's an interrogative. Or if I ask you, um, uh, what's the definition of an assertion? That's... A question. So anything that ends with a question mark is an uh, is an interrogative sentence. There's also imperatives. Remember what are those? Commands. Yes, they're commands. As in, um, write this down or um, drop the gun. You know, whatever the case could be. A lot of possible commands you can imagine. Okay, and then finally there were exclamations, which are like momentary expressions of feeling, often. Uh, single words or phrases with an exclamation point. Um, they don't have a full-on grammatical structure of subject and predicate. There are things on the par of like, whoa, uh, boo, yay, wow, and things of that kind. They just express the inner psychological state of the subject at the time they speak. But the only sentences that really are of great importance to us in logic and critical thinking are the assertoric ones, the assertions, because those are the only ones that can populate the position of premises and conclusions in arguments, okay? So like there's no argument with the conclusion with a question in it. Uh, there's no argument where the conclusion is a command. Uh, they're always just assertions of various kinds. Okay, and then last piece of review, and then we'll be able to move on to the next stu uh, stuff. We talked about conclusion and premise indicator words, yeah? So like what are some of the well-known conclusion indicator words? Words which indicate here comes the conclusion of some piece of reasoning or argument. Words like, let me therefore. Understand. Therefore, yeah, that's one of them. Uh, also, there's simply the word so, that's right. Ergo, yes. Um, any other favorites? Therefore, so, ergo, one or two more, just to fill out that range. Thus, uh -huh, consequently, hence is another good one. Thanks, Nancy. All right, fair enough. So, like, imagine this was just being spoken. Jones has lipstick in his, on his collar, and he didn't come home last night, so Jones is cheating on his wife. Or consequently, therefore, hence, thus, this. You know? So those are words that indicate a conclusion. And there are also premise indicator words, which are words which indicate here's a piece of evidence that supports a conclusion. And those could be words of what kind? Let's see if anyone remembers a few. <clears throat> Correct, yeah, Daniel, because... Um, or for example, what's another possibility? You just want to get at least the main two because it's one of the big two. The other, well, there's given that, that's fine. 
There's one more I think that's even more commonly used since. That's fair. Yeah, I was hoping to at least get because and since. All right, so like because he has lipstick on his collar and since he didn't come home last night, it follows that he's cheating on his wife, or consequently, he's cheating on his wife. So given that, because, due to the fact that, since, these are all premise indicator of words. Okay, thanks. Now, last thing, I guess, just briefly, as the meeting was closing, I was telling you about how um, you have to be alert to the difference between a real argument and then just a set of statements that do not add up to an argument. Um, basically, if there's no inference involved and there's no support relationship, from premises to conclusion, then even if all the statements are true, for example, they don't add to an argument. Like if I told you I'm wearing a plaid shirt and um, it's warm outside and I have an Audi car, that's not an argument. I mean, that's just three facts, but none of them is like evidence towards any of the other things. So you have to basically be alert to the existence of a word like therefore or so, you know, which draws a connection between pieces of evidence and then a claim that's based off them. Okay, guys, so good. That's just our review to get the meeting started. Always like to do that, not to leave anybody behind or to kind of let the information fade away in your mind, keep it clear. But now let's continue because today we have some important work to do. We have to expand a little bit more now on the topic of argument. And um, the main point of today's lesson is to teach you guys about the two major types of argument in logic. There's two main types of argument or forms of reasoning, and that is deduction versus induction. So we're going to learn about deduction and induction today. So <clears throat> two types of argument slash reasoning. And that is uh, deduction versus, on the other hand, induction. Just need a little more room. Sorry, guys. Thanks. Deduction versus induction. OK. So um, <clears throat> let's start off. We'll, we'll start off working on what is a deductive argument. And this is like a core concept that is really one of the most fundamental to the whole class. And, really to your whole human life. So I, we really got to make sure this comes out clearly. So when you're reasoning deductively or when you're engaging with deductive argumentation, a good deductive argument is labeled as a deductively valid argument. Okay. So, and by the way, once again, I noticed the transcript is like not properly spelling certain words. Let me see if it gets this deductively. But deductedly. <laughs> like, so anyway, if you look at the transcript, it's silly. Deductively valid. I'll write it over here. Okay. So deductively valid argument. Here's what it means. So I'm going to put the definition right here. A deductively valid argument means that if the premises of the argument are all true, okay, so it's an if-then, this definition. If the premises are all true, then, in that case, the conclusion must, must necessarily also be true. Okay, there we have the definition of a deductively valid argument. It is an argument such that if the premises, if all the premises are true, then in that case, the conclusion must also be true. All right. Now, we're going to expand on this concept by offering a bunch of examples and reasoning our way through the examples. <clears throat> so let's try this. <clears throat> Um, okay, first premise, all dogs are mammals. Second premise, um, 
A beagle is a dog. So let us just use elementary deduction to derive the conclusion of that argument. I'm sure you can tell me. So whenever you got it, let me know. All dogs are mammals and a beagle is a dog. So therefore what? Beagles are mammals. Yeah, therefore a beagle is a mammal. Okay, now in this argument, is it valid? Yes, it is because if these two statements are true, then doesn't this also have to be true? Yes. In other words, it's not even possible for these two things to be facts and for this to be incorrect. Because the first premise says all dogs are mammals, not some, not most, all. Like, right? So all dogs are creatures that are warm blooded and give live birth. Anyway, all dogs are mammals. So then if we just pick out one specimen of dog, say beagles, for example, then it will logically follow that a beagle is a mammal because as mentioned in the first premise, all the dogs are. So there's no possibility for this to turn out false if these two claims are true. That's why it's valid. In a deductively valid argument, if we are given the truth of the premises, then the conclusion has to be true as well. Okay, and like to make that even more obviously clear, you've seen the definition of deductive validity there. Just to make it uh, something that we don't lose in our notes, I'm gonna put it in the chat one time just to kind of get that important info there. <clears throat> So I just put it there in the chat so we can have that to refer to. And as it's written on the board, if all the premises of the argument are true, then in that case, the conclusion must also be true. And I added emphasis to the word must, since that's kind of like a key distinctive part of the definition by capitalizing it. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so like, for example, here, I'm going to draw a little diagram, which is going to make it visually obvious that this argument is valid. So I'm drawing a circle here, which I'm labeling with the letter D, and that stands for all the dogs, okay? So like, suppose that this is a set which contains every dog, all dogs, your dog, his dog, her dog, every dog, it's in that circle. Okay, now, to show that all dogs are mammals on this diagram, I'm gonna draw another circle labeled M, which is gonna stand for mammals. But what will be the spatial relationship between D and M? Like, how will you tell me to draw that circle M on the board to indicate that all of these dogs are mammals? Just think about that. It encompasses all of D. Right, very good. So fully subsuming this circle in a larger circle. Okay, correct. So here, let the larger circle be M, which is standing for mammals. Now, why is there this region that is outside of D, but still within M, because there are other non-dogs, which are also mammals, like humans, bears, cats, lions, tigers. Okay, so those are all these things in the outside region. But in the overlap between D and M, it's all the mammalian dogs. Okay, now, the second premise is a beagle is a dog. So how can I reflect that on the graph? I'll have to add the letter B, but where should it go? Inside of this circle, right? Because a beagle is a dog, so it's gonna be one thing that's a member of that category. And there's all the other dogs too, you know, Cocker Spaniel, Labrador Retriever, Golden Retriever, you know. So does it follow that a beagle is a mammal? Of course, because it's within the larger set of concentric circles and there's no other way to draw it such that these two premises are still true. So from these two facts, this logically follows. That's why it's deductively valid. And the argument diagram kind of just shows us that. Um, okay. <clears throat> so <clears throat> let us work on another example. Let's try this. Um, no human being has walked on Mars. <clears throat> Not yet, anyway. Maybe in a hundred years, this will be false. 
but for now, that's true. The moon, yeah, not Mars. Okay, but anyway, no human being has walked on Mars. What's the name of a, a real life human being that we all know? Go ahead. John. No, I mean a real, first and last name of a real person. John's just a, you know, that's like a character name. John who? Lennon? John Ashcroft? Or like John Bolton? Uh, I need a real person. So let me hear it. You got billions of people to choose from, everybody. So just pick a human. Who is David Bowie? Bowie. Sorry, I heard a lot at once. I'm, but that's okay. What was one again? Oh, now the mic's off, so I can't even hear you. Uh. I said David Bowie. Hannah said Will Smith. And now somebody in the chat said, said Shane Connery. Connery. Okay, yeah. So let me go with Will Smith because he's still living. I mean, but Bowie is fine. And that would be okay, too. Nonetheless, we'll go with Will Smith. Will Smith is a human being. Okay, so what's the valid conclusion of this deductive argument? No human being has walked on Mars, and Will Smith is a human, so therefore it follows that what? That Will Smith hasn't walked on Mars? Yes, he hasn't walked on Mars. That is the conclusion of the argument. So just WS for the sake of abbreviation, has not walked on Mars. Will Smith hasn't even gone into outer space. No, yeah, he hasn't, so most of us haven't. Um, now we get a couple of private citizens starting to you know, appear in the stratosphere with these billionaire guys. But yes, uh, very few people have ever escaped the um, atmosphere of the Earth's surface. Anyway, this is also a valid argument. Can we kind of agree on that? Because if these two facts are true, and they are, then this has to be true as well. And once again, a diagram can help to show why. So I'm going to diagram and label one circle as H for human beings. Okay. Another circle is going to be labeled M for things that have walked on Mars. Okay, so where will the circle M be in relationship to H since no human has walked on Mars? Doesn't touch it? Yeah, it'll be disjoint. They will not overlap at all because there's not even one single person that's done that. So if there was one, there'd be like this tiny overlap, but no. So here are the people or things that have walked on Mars. No humans have walked on Mars. Now, where does a little WS go since Will Smith is a human? I should place that within the circle H. Yes, here it is. Now, can we see that the conclusion is guaranteed by the premises? Yes, because as long as Will Smith's a member of this class, humans, and as long as that is completely disjoint from anything that's ever walked on Mars, like the Mars rover has walked on Mars, but like no human beings have, um, it shows us that being a member of this a set, which is a disjoint set from M, it follows that WS is not placed within that set, and therefore it's not any such person's walk on Mars, including Will Smith. Okay, so just a few different random examples of deductively valid arguments. <clears throat> but I'm not done, because I just want it to really sink in. So maybe I'll try one or two more, and then we can move on to some new definitions. Um, All right, so suppose the first premise is Dr. Vulich was born in the 80s. Um, and then I'll just say student, just as a generic name, was born in the 2000s. So if Dr. Village was born in the 80s, student was born in the 2000s, is there something that has to be true based off of those two claims? Let me know what it is when, you, when you're ready. Uh, Dr. Village is not a student. No, that doesn't follow. I could just be an old student. So no. You're not using the second proposition at all. Go ahead. What's the right conclusion? You're looking at numbers, right? I'm just trying to get the vibe what I'm doing here. I was born in the 80s. You're born after that. Therefore, what? Therefore, a student is younger or Vulich is older. Either way, you go. Yeah, that's fine, Jacob. Okay, good. So I was born in the 80s. Student was born in 2000. So Vulich is older than student. <clears throat> now, a lot of you guys might be the type of person who this is true of, that you were born in the 2000s. So if I'm born in the 80s, which, by the way, I am. Sorry to say that. 
and then you were born in two decades later, obviously that means that I'm older than you today because that's how just the numbers work. There's no way for me to be born in the 80s. You're born in the 2000s, but wait, you're older than me. That's just a mathematical impossibility, okay? So once again, I'm just exposing you to examples of arguments where there's information contained in the premises that guarantees that the conclusion is true. It's not that this is probably true, like 99% likely, 100% necessary that if these two things are true, this must be as well, okay? Um, and just one more before we can move on. Uh, let's try this. Or maybe I'm lying, I might do just do two more, but let's see. Proposition or premise one. Um, sorry. So let's just say um, Alex is taller than um, Bill. Premise two, <clears throat> Bill is taller than um, Melissa. So Alex is taller than Bill. Bill is taller than Melissa. Can you tell me a conclusion that follows from those premises that has to be true? Therefore, Alex is taller than Mel Melissa. Yes, yes, correct. Therefore, Alex is taller than Melissa. Now, again, is it valid? It is valid because suppose these two things are true for some, you know, people that match these definitions or descriptions. Um, if Alex is taller than Bill, and, and secondly, Bill is also taller than a third person named Melissa, then it's not possible for this to be false. And just, I mean, think about it. Alex, taller than Bill. Bill, taller than Melissa. Obviously, Alex is taller than Melissa. There's no way for this to be false if the first two statements are true. So yet again, we see a deductively valid argument, okay? This is like a core concept of logic and critical thinking to understand the concept of deductive validity. It's of the very first importance. So that's why I kind of spend a lot of time on it and make sure that it sinks in. Um, with deductive validity, the reason, one reason that it's so important is because if you have a valid argument, then that guarantees something, that if the premises are given, then the conclusion can never be false. So with a deductively valid argument, you can never proceed from true premises to a false conclusion. That combination where the premises are true and the conclusion is false, it's not possible if the argument is valid. Okay, so it's always a nice thing to know that your argument is valid, because that means that if your opponent or whoever you're talking with grants you your assumed premises, they have to concede the conclusion because it's a logical consequence of those premises. Okay, um, maybe one last, just to kind of make sure this is at least getting clearer. Um, let's say Long Beach is in California. Um, <clears throat> And um, Vulich is in Long Beach. So therefore, what? You are in California. Yes, therefore, Vulich is in California. And that, of course, is yet again an example of a valid argument. Because um, if the premises are true, the conclusion has to be true. So if we have this, LB, it's contained within California, and then I'm a person who's there within Long Beach. Clearly, I'm also in California because all places inside of Long Beach are places inside of the state of California. Okay, <clears throat> now, I think that that's coming through at least somewhat clearly. We'll work that over again as we go on, but that's your just first opening gambit into the idea behind uh, deductive validity. So from here, we, got, we all have to kind of start to understand a related topic within deduction, and that is the concept of what is called soundness, okay? So let me write this down for you one time. Okay. So sound. Soundness, or being sound, is when there is a deductively valid argument 
with all true premises. Okay, so sound is a deductively valid argument. So it's valid, but it has this additional feature that all the premises are actually true. Okay, so that is what it is for an argument to be sound. I'm going to put that in the chat one time as well. Okay, so it is, as you can see it written there, it's a deductively valid argument with all true premises. The reason that we have to refer to this concept is because not every valid argument is sound. There can be, in other words, a valid but unsound argument. And so I'm going to try and help you guys understand the difference between an argument which is both valid and also sound versus an argument that is only valid but it doesn't have the soundness going on. Okay, so let's go ahead and try and give you some examples like that. Okay, so how about this? All men, um, are tall, Kevin Hart is a man, so just in terms of validity, what should be the conclusion of this argument, which says, again, that all men are tall, and uh, Kevin Hart is a man, so therefore what appears to follow is the statement that what? Kevin Hart is tall? Yes, the Kevin Hart is tall. Okay, good. Wait, not every man is tall, though. I know, I know. That's why it's not sound. So, good. Tell me, what's the status of the argument? Is it valid? Uh, the, no. the false statement that all men are tall? That doesn't make it invalid, though. So just a yes or no. Is it valid or not? It is invalid. It, no, you're wrong. It's valid. It's valid. Why? Don't be thrown off by the fact that the first premise is false, because that's not what validity is about, the truth of the premises. Validity is about the logical link between the information given here and the conclusion. So when you're just looking at validity, you can completely set aside what the real world is. And all you're being asked to judge is this. Does this statement follow from these statements? Okay, can we now see that it is valid? It's valid, why? Because yes. if these were true, it's a hypothetical. If all men are tall, if, and if Kevin Hart is a man, then it does follow that Kevin Hart is tall. So the right answer is that it is valid, but it's not what? <laughs> Sorry, I almost heard it one more time. Sound. Yeah, it is not sound, correct, very good. Now, Blake, let me ask you a follow-up. Why isn't it sound? Because you know that all men are, uh, all men uh, aren't all tall. Yeah, not and, all men are tall. Exactly. So yeah, first, and then Kevin Hart is pretty short. Yeah, well, he is a man. That much is true, at least. Yeah, but yeah. but all men are tall. The first premise is a false statement because it's not the case that 100% of men are tall. And Kevin Hart, especially, is one that's kind of short. Um, I could have made a shorter. Danny DeVito. You guys ever heard of it? It's always sunny in Philadelphia. He's quite short. Um, but anyway, this is still valid. Just on the basis that the logic from the premises implies the conclusion. And so we can show how it's valid. For example, suppose that this is all the men. If all men are tall, then what should the circle uh, labeled with the letter T, how should that be drawn on the board in relation to M? Uh, all, T should be on the outside. Yeah, it should surround M. Okay, good. So all men are tall is depicted by this little piece of graph. Now, Kevin Hart, being a man, should fall where within the graph? Inside of the M. Yes, right. K, H, Kevin Hart. So now doesn't it follow that he's tall? Yes, just, you know, 
looking at the graph itself, there's no way to characterize these two as true statements, but yet this is false. On the assumption that all men are tall, and on the assumption that Kevin Hart is one of these men, all of whom are tall, yes, it does follow then that he's tall. So it's valid, but not sound. Valid, but not sound, because just in the pure sense of logic, the conclusion is implied by the premises. But when you look at soundness, that's when you have to compare the premises to the actual world. Okay, so the evaluation of validity is just about information content. It's not about checking whether the facts are real. Soundness, though, does require that additional step, where on top of it being a logically implied conclusion, the statements that fill out the premises are actually all true to the reality. Okay, so now, all the previous examples that I gave just before this were valid and sound. So like if I say, um, no man has walked on Mars, Elon Musk, Tiger Woods is a man, just for another example. Um, so Tiger Woods has not walked on Mars. You guys understand that's valid, but it's also sound, right? Because in that different example, the premises are true to the facts. Like no man has walked on Mars, true. Tiger Woods is a man, also true. That does logically imply that he's not walked on Mars. But now in this case, we have a valid argument with that little additional factor of being sound. Okay, so soundness is like validity plus. It's valid plus all the statements are true to the reality. Okay, so like um, if I say no woman has been president and Beyonce is a woman, what would be the conclusion? Beyonce hasn't been president. Right, and that argument would be what and what? Sound and valid. Yes, that would be valid and sound because the logic checks out. You know, the conclusion is a consequence of the premises that follows from them, but also the premises are both facts. They're both true. Um, <clears throat> now, you're hearing that, and maybe some students are like, well, why are there these valid but not sound arguments? Should they just all be sound because they should just all be dealing with the facts? The thing is, um, humans being what we are, we're not omniscient gods, right? So like we are not always perfectly aware of what the facts are. So in some cases, the best we can do is to produce an argument which is valid and then leave it to our critics and opponents to try and contest whether all of our premises are actually true or not. But when the argument's valid, even if it is unsound, at a minimum, it's got a good positive status because it means that if somebody grants you your premises or assumes they are true, then the conclusion that follows from them would have to be true as well. Um, in a perfect world where we would never have any errors in judgment, every valid argument would also be sound. But in some cases, we just have to say to a person, yeah, you know, your argument's valid, but I disagree with some of your assumptions, right? Like what if somebody made this argument, like women are better at cooking and I have a wife, so she should cook. Um, you could say, well, that's a valid argument, but I don't agree that it is sound because it says in the first premise that all women are good at cooking. And that's not really true necessarily. So in that case, someone could say, well, logically, I hear you. I see why you're drawing this conclusion, but you're relying on a couple of false or at least one false assumption. OK, so that is the logical difference between validity and soundness. It's just something that we have to kind of understand and get a little familiar with. Um, and when we get to another moment in class, I'll like try to ask some of you guys to supply and generate some examples of these different forms of argument, like give me an example of an argument which is valid but not sound. Actually, let's try and do that right now. So who thinks they could say an example of a valid but unsound argument? And I'll give you some hints to help. One easy valid but not sound argument generator is to just start the argument with a false all statement, like what I said before, all men are tall, or like all women have short hair, or like, you know, anything like that. And then you can simply plug in the remaining sentences to get to your logical conclusion. So let's see if anybody can supply me with some type of example like that. It can start with a false all statement, a false no statement. Okay, Karen, you say Harry Potter's a girl, but that's only one premise. I'm not sure where you're going with that. I mean, yes, that's false. Harry Potter also, though, is a fictional character, so it's kind of like hard to even say what's true about a fictional character. But uh, if you're going to give me an example, you have to write the whole argument out. And an argument, as you know, is never just one sentence. So don't think that I'm asking you to just write one false sentence down. It's an argument, so it has to have premises that lead to a conclusion. So go ahead, try again. Nancy, all women have their nails painted. Sally is a woman. Okay, and so what will be the conclusion there, Nancy? I think everyone can see it, but let me hear it from anybody if they can see the example in the chat. 
All women have nails painted. Sally's a woman, and therefore, what follows? Sally has her nails painted. Yes, yeah, Sally therefore has her nails painted. Good. Now that's valid, you see. But it's not sound because which sentence is false? All women have their nails painted. Yeah, that's not true. Not all women have their nails painted. Some do. Maybe, I don't even know what the statistical distribution is, but it's certainly not 100%. Okay, there you go. Blake, all men have facial hair. Alex is a man. Therefore, Alex has facial hair would be the conclusion. You're getting it, right? That's valid. But it's not sound simply because, no, not all men have facial hair, including just looking in the camera, some of us that are present at this meeting now. Okay, good. So that's sinking in. I just want to kind of make sure that that's clear. But you guys are doing good with it. You know, sometimes I've taught this material on validity and soundness, and it's like people get lost. Uh, maybe some of you will be confused too, but I feel like at least initially there's some good comprehension coming back to me. Karen, you say all children have a car. Fair enough. Uh, Blake is a kid, a child, right? And so I'm thinking that you're going to conclude that Blake what? <clears throat> Therefore, hence, thus, so, consequently, ergo, what's the conclusion? It's easy enough, but just one time. Let me know. Blake has a car. Yeah, therefore, Blake has a car. Perfect, right, exactly. Okay, good. So validity and its cousin, soundness. That's now, I hope, starting to sink in. Um, now, I told you that we're learning about the two main forms of argument and reasoning. So deduction is one of the two. On the other hand, there is induction. So now we have to kind of get into that. What does it mean for there to be an inductive argument? Okay. So what I just told you with deduction is that um, a good deductive argument is termed some deductively valid argument, meaning, again, that if the premises are true, then the conclusion is a given, and it has to be true as well. With an inductive argument, the word that is used for a good one, it's not validity or valid, but instead it is the term strong. So we talk about deductively valid arguments. On the other hand, we have inductively strong arguments. And here's what that means, okay? So inductively strong argument. <clears throat> So an inductively strong argument means this. If all of the premises are true, so that much is the same as the other definition. If all the premises are true, then in that case, the conclusion, it's not that it's guaranteed to necessarily be true, but rather that it's probably true, that it's highly likely to be. Okay, so I'll write it down. If all of the premises are true, Then, in that case, the conclusion is highly likely to be true, probably true, but not absolutely guaranteed, unlike deduction validity. Highly likely to also to be true, also. Okay, so although it is on the board, I'm going to also type it into the chat so that we have it there as a reference once I clear the board. So give me a second to type it out. So there it is, uh, and you can read it. It says, inductively strong argument, definition. If all of the premises are true, then the conclusion is highly likely to be also to be true. Okay. So your real big difference between a deductively valid argument and an inductively strong one is that with deductive validity, the truth of the premises guarantees, forces the conclusion to be true no matter what. With inductive strength, the premises only take you so far. They take you towards the likelihood that the conclusion is true, but they don't 100% guarantee it. So inductive strength leaves open the slim possibility that the conclusion could be false, even though the premises are true. It's just that that's not so likely. Okay, so now let me give you some various examples of that. <clears throat> Uh, 
Um, here, like this is a textbook example of an inductively strong argument. So I'm going to go with it first, but then we're going to spin off like as many different variations on it as we can. So I'm just going to keep this short with one premise. And the premise is going to just say this information. That the sun has come up every morning uh, for a long time. For how many years? I mean, billions of years. The Earth is believed to be something like four or five billion years old. And uh, the whole time it's existed, it's been in the solar system. So every morning the sun has come up for all of recorded history. That's a long track record. Anyway, the sun has come up every morning for billions of years. So what might be a really very likely conclusion to draw from that information? The sun's come up every morning for billions of years already. And so therefore, we could maybe safely conclude that what? Therefore, the sun is billions of years old? Uh, not so much that, because... I, I like the attempt, but the problem with that is that that would be like deductive because um, it's not possible that it's come up if it hasn't existed for the whole time. So we need something that's more like a probability prediction. Okay, Gunnar, you got it, that the sun will come up tomorrow. Yeah, that's what I was fishing for. Therefore, the sun will come up tomorrow. Now, don't you guys think the sun will come up tomorrow? I mean, I hope you do. It'd be kind of depressing to think this is the last day. Um, but yeah, you do think it'll come up tomorrow. And what reason do you have to think that? Well, it's just the same reasons given here, because as far back as anybody knows, it's always been coming up every single morning without any exceptions. So if that's been happening for billions of years already, wouldn't it seem pretty likely to conclude that it will happen at least one more time? Sure. But let's get into the point. Can this be guaranteed, though? Can we say 100% that since it has come up every morning for billions of years, definitely 100% it's coming up tomorrow? Is that a guarantee? No. No, it's not a guarantee because, you know, look, the sun itself won't come up forever. I mean, it's a star. And as you guys know, every star has a finite amount of fuel. Eventually, they run out of that, and then they supernova and explode. And when that happens, there won't even be the solar system that we're a part of right now. So then there won't even be a sun to come up. That's believed to happen way billions of years out into the future. But, you know, it's not impossible that our models and predictions could be off. Or maybe like a passing interstellar object, like a giant asteroid or something could collide with it and blow it apart. Um, at any rate, it's very likely that the sun will come up tomorrow, but it cannot be made into a 100% guarantee just on the basis of the past track record. Nonetheless, it's highly likely, so it's a strong argument. It's an inductively strong argument. So notice the difference between deduction and induction. If I told you that I'm taller than, you know, John and John is taller than Sally, then it's not just like probable that I'm taller than Sally. It's necessary because those two statements necessitate and imply the conclusion. With inductive strength, the premises provide ample support for the conclusion, but they just can't absolutely guarantee it. So the common um, uh, sort of pattern that you see when you look at inductively strong arguments is there's some reference in the premises to a long-standing pattern that's been observed over time. And then the conclusion is just the assertion that that pattern will continue into the next observed instance. Uh, Eddie, no. <laughs> I've heard it said before that um, you can think of it on this model. The premises say like such and such has happened n number of times, where n is just like a big natural number. And then the conclusion is that such and such will happen in the n plus one time, like so in the next observable instance. Um, and as long as the track record goes back far enough, then the probability of the conclusion will be pretty high. So let me give you other examples. Um, let's think. Uh, here's one. So every president of the United States has been a man. And uh, let me add a reference to the time period. Every president of the United States for over 200 years has been a man. So what might somebody conclude from that uh, premise? Therefore, the next president is going to be a man? Yeah, correct. Now, it seems like that's probable just looking at our country's history. I'm not saying this is good or whatever. You know, Probably there are many qualified women that 
it's been overlooked or haven't been able to attain it because of you know inequities that we have. But anyway, that's a fact. Every president so far has been male. So if somebody says in over 200 years of history, we've never had one president, so the next one will also be a man, there's a reasonable basis for them to think that that's true. But can it be guaranteed that the next president will be a man? Is that absolutely a given? No. Obviously, with induction, though we have probability behind a conclusion, there always remains the chance that they will turn out differently. Like, So this pattern could have been interrupted in 2016 if Hillary Clinton had won. Um, for now, though, that's not the case. We have qualified women that could win in the next election or next couple of elections, so someday maybe this pattern will break. But when you look at induction, you simply compare the past to what you expect to see in the future. Um, as another example, prior to the election of Barack Obama in 2008, you could have made the argument that every president has been a white male you know, for over 200 years, so the next president will be white as well. And then Barack Obama is the one exception to that. So you see there that the inductive pattern has the potential to turn out differently than it had been in the past. But nonetheless, we have to use induction all the time. We use it every day, subconsciously, without even thinking, because we have to form expectations about what to expect in the future based on what we have observed and experienced in the past. So like when you get into your car, for example, supposing you have one, right? But anyway, suppose you get in your car and you turn the key, or if you have one of those more flashy cars, you push the button, what would you expect to happen after that? The car starts. Yeah, why would you expect that? What's your reason? Because it's done it ever since you got the car. Good, right. So if you've never had a car not start, and the engine won't turn over, and you've, say, owned your car for years, then you might reason like follows. In all my years driving this car, five years, whatever, it's never not started. So when I try to start the car today, it will start. Again, it's probable, given that track record. But you can't guarantee that either. You know, There's always that one possible random occurrence where there's a mechanical malfunction or some other kind of error in the car such that it's a break from what you've experienced in the past. OK, I'm going to keep going with more inductively strong arguments to kind of make sure this makes clear enough sense for all of you guys. Um, so I'm a, I'm up in my 30s, you know, I've been alive for a while now. And to this day, I can say I've never been shot. <laughs> so never once have I been shot in over 30 years. Therefore, might conclude that what? You'll never be shot. Okay, I, I want to focus on that. Um, so never being shot is perhaps too open-ended into the future. Normally, the inductively strong arguments, the conclusion will only refer to the next case. Um, so how would you revise that conclusion, perhaps, in keeping with that point? I won't be shot this year or, or, or even just tomorrow, right? Yeah, so I do think it's probable that I won't get shot tomorrow because since it's never happened already and I'm over 30, you know, you get the vibe that it's not the sort of thing that happens with any frequency, it, you know. So if it's not happened in 30 years, it probably won't happen today. But things being what they are and, you know, the world that we live in, you can never absolutely guarantee that either, can you, sadly? So as you hopefully are catching on with inductive arguments. Yeah, I, I'll knock on the wood, thanks. Yeah, you know, hopefully never get to me. But anyway, yeah, we'll see. Anyway though, yeah, so you guys understand inductive arguments. They're inductively strong when the premises provide strong probability for the conclusion. But with inductive strength, they never go all the way towards absolutely guaranteeing necessitating that conclusion. Okay, can anybody think of a different example? Let's see you try it out. What could be an inductively strong argument? And so the pattern you're looking for is some type of phenomenon or set of events that has always happened in a certain way or something that has never happened as another possibility. And then the conclusion will simply be that this expected pattern that has been seen will continue. So what could be an example like that? I've given you already like the sun coming up, never having been shot, car will start, you know, because it always has before. Um, in 19 years of my life, I've never failed a class. Okay, good. So you've never failed a class. Therefore, we might conclude that you won't uh, fail any classes this term. That's fine. Trung, you've woken up every day, and therefore you'll wake up tomorrow. Good. And I mean, let me say this. If it was like a, um, like a toddler making that argument, I mean, toddlers aren't very good at stating arguments, but then there wouldn't be enough years. So it's always nice to include a reference to the amount of time so that it's explicit how strong the argument is, you know. Um, yeah, and so Carly, you have a good example. I have bones. I have not broken a bone since I've been alive, which again, you could reference, you know, that you're 20, however old you are, and therefore it won't happen today either. And I certainly hope that it doesn't. Um, 
Michael Burt. Since dormant volcanoes do not erupt, they most likely never erupt. Well, you know, you stated almost categorically, Michael. There's only it's good, but there's just a few things I would edit. First of all, you might refer to um, a particular dormant volcano rather than the whole class of them. And then you might refer to how long that specific volcano has not erupted. So you could say like Mount Vesuvius has not erupted in, um, I don't know the fact, but like 200 years. And so therefore it will not erupt today, which is probably reasonable. But again, we can't guarantee that that won't happen just because it hasn't happened over that whole frame of time. Good. AJ, uh, you've played contact sports for years without getting hurt, so you won't get hurt at practice today. Another good example. Yeah, I, I'm not 100% familiar with some of these mountains either, Michael, so that's fair. Yeah, no, not to worry. I know we're all just doing our best right now. Um, let's see. Um, athletic performance is another interesting example. So, like, let me think. LeBron James has made the All-Star game for 18 seasons in a row. So, therefore, maybe one would conclude that what? He'll make it again this season. Yeah, that he'll make it again this season. Or I think this is the 18th season. So this would be looking at next year and saying he'll make it again next year. Um, after a certain number of years, it starts to seem pretty reliable and predictable that that will happen. But again, this is induction. It's not deduction. So nobody can say with 100% confidence that, yes, he will make the All-Star game next year because he could anything could happen. He could get injured, um, die, God forbid, or you know something that would prevent him from even being able to attend the game. Or he could have a sudden drop off in his production and you know doesn't qualify for it. Um, okay, good. Now, Blake, another one. Disneyland is open for 60 plus years, so therefore they'll be open this year. That's fair. Um, but again, like some kind of mass closure uh, might happen. Um, prior to the pandemic, you know, there's a lot of inductive conclusions that turned out incorrect because of how it disrupted all of our lives. You know, think of your whole schooling all the way up until 2020. You might have said like, oh, in 16, 17, however old you were, years of school, I've never had to take classes online. Uh, so I won't have to take classes online or I won't take classes online this year. But of course, just a little example in how we rely on induction and it's usually reliable and probability is there, but um, they don't offer ironclad guarantees as different from deduction. Okay, um, Karen, I have $200 right now, therefore I will have it in 10 days. I don't know how strong that one is, Karen, only because there's no information given about how you tend to uh, manage money. So if you had said something like, you know, I've never um, squandered $200 in a 10 day period throughout my life. And right now I have $10, you know, something like that. Um, but we aren't in a position to know based on just the information of the argument itself, how likely you are to not have wasted that money over 10 days. Um, Okay, so inductive. Now, there can also be inductively weak arguments, and there can also be invalid arguments. So I kind of want to make mention of those, because those are both bad, and you don't want to um, rely on an indu inductively weak argument. It's certainly not one that is deductively invalid. So let's go with inductively weak. What if I told you that um, I bought a lottery ticket yesterday, I won the lottery, so therefore, if I buy a lottery ticket next Monday, I will win the lottery again. Is that conclusion very likely, even if the premise is true? No. No, and that's because of the high degree of unlikelihood that there is in winning the lottery even once. So just based on one lucky occurrence, this is not the type of thing that's liable to uh, repeat with any frequency. So it's of the form of an inductive argument, but it's not strong because the premise does not even justify a high probability of the conclusion. It would be like saying I found $20 on the ground um, today, so therefore I will find $20 on the ground tomorrow. You know, if you know about finding money on the ground, it's it's always fun and sort of unexpected because most of the time people don't drop their money on the floor because, you know, everyone wants to keep it. And therefore, that's not something that you could say would happen with any repetition. On the other hand, I mean, imagine a possible world where somebody says, you know, I found $20 um, on the ground every day for the last 300 days. So I'll find $20 on the ground tomorrow. That's a different case. That would be inductively strong, but I'm changing the hypothetical there to a situation where this happens all the time. Okay, Blake, you give us this. I got stung by a stingray at the beach today. Therefore, I'll be stung at the beach next time. Yeah, that would be inductively weak because that type of event is rare. And so if it only happened one time, we don't have enough evidence to say that the conclusion is really well-based and probable. Okay, good. Sometimes people have superstitious beliefs that are inductively weak. 
Like maybe you say I wore red socks and then my professor canceled class, giving me more time to study for the quiz. So if I wear my red socks next week, he'll cancel class again. There's no causal connection. There's no law-like relationship between your choice of wardrobe and then that random outcome. So you can't predict anything with any probability based off of that. Okay. Um, if there's a student that's had perfect attendance, K through 12, and this is the last week of their senior year of high school, you might say, they're, therefore, they will come to class this week. Um, and it's probable, isn't it, based on their reliable track record, but again, with attendance and anything else, we can't say that that's 100% certain. But nonetheless, induction gives us um, a reasonable expectation of the conclusion. Carly, you say this, I bought a banana on a boat and we did not catch any fish. So if I bring a banana on a boat next time, I won't catch fish. Sure, good, that's, that's fine. And that sort of follows the same format of my just now example, um, some unrelated events, the color of the socks, the cancellation of the class, the having- That's a, a real superstition too. Oh, is it really? So people won't bring bananas on boats. Well, you know, we got to look at the statistics. Is the, Maybe there's some uh, mysterious, um, you know, type of new age relationship between uh, the items on the boat and then the catching of the fish. But yeah, I, I, I just take your point. It's, it's totally unrelated. It's just a superstitious thought. And so good, good example there again. Okay. Um, now also there can be in, there can be deductively invalid arguments. So let me go ahead and try and uh, get one of those on the table. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Um, so back to deduction for a moment. <clears throat> Most women have long hair. Ellen, like Ellen DeGeneres, is a woman. Therefore, Ellen has long hair. Is this argument valid? Yes or no? I would say yes, based on the facts, but we know also that Ellen doesn't have long hair. Well, okay. But no, though, it's not actually valid because do these statements even guarantee this is true? Oh, no, because of most. Yeah, most doesn't say all. And so even if these two things are true, by the way, they are both true. That doesn't guarantee this, and therefore not valid, not valid. And just to show on a diagram how it's not, so let this be women, okay? Now I'm gonna have another circle that's that designates long hairs. How will that stand in relation to W, if most women have long hair? It's kind of it's like a inside of it. Yeah, there'll be like Venn diagrams overlapping, and the, the overlap will contain most of this set, okay? So like, let's say this is long haired things. Okay, so like there's some, you know, men with long hair, animals and non-women, but most of the women here are long-haired beings. There's this unshaded region over here that lies outside of the overlap, and that would be women with no long hair. So Ellen is a woman, so she could just be right there. But now you see that the resources provided by these premises don't establish that this has to be true. Just because most women have long hair and that Ellen is a woman, it doesn't follow that Ellen has long hair. If this had said all, then what would have then been the status of the argument? If the first premise said all women have long hair, then now we would have had what, what argument? It's valid, but not sound. Very good, exactly, correct. So in that case, it would have been valid, but not sound because of the falsehood of the all statement, but the logic would have still computed and led us to that logically uh, valid conclusion. Okay. <clears throat> so when we make arguments or when we are evaluating them, we're looking to see whether they are valid invalid, whether they're sound, or if they're inductive, whether they're strong or weak. Um, and today I've just done my best to try and inform you about that cluster of important concepts and logic. Let me see a few other, ex or one other example I see here from Rayanne in the chat. You say, my friend's parents bought him a Porsche, so my parents are gonna buy me a Porsche. Okay, so I'm thinking that would be the inductively weak example, right? Because it's derived from just one example. And, you know, reasonably speaking, the fact that somebody else's parent has bought them a porch doesn't really lend any credibility or evidence to what your own parents will do because it's not necessarily like a widespread phenomenon. If you had said everybody's parents that I know have bought them a porch, maybe that would have been a different case. But 
this example that's clear that that's inductively weak. Okay, so um, let me just go over some of the major points that we've covered today. And then I think we'll be mostly all right until we meet again on Thursday. Um, keep in mind that on Thursday, I'm going to start to uh, talk to you guys about the first homework assignment, and that's going to be due a week from then, the next upcoming uh, Thursday. Let me double check and make sure I'm giving you that right info. Um, yeah, correct. So next Thursday, the 17th, uh, next week, Thursday, that's when the first homework will be due just in person. You'll hand it in hard copy to me. Um, unless there's a student that couldn't make it to class, then they can email me their submission. But it's going to have to do with the forms of deductively valid argument that we will all speak about on, on Thursday. So hold on for that. Um, Blake, you gave the example, most cars have radios, therefore my car has a radio. What was the intended um, status of that argument, Blake? That's a deductively weak argument. Oh, okay. Well, let's make sure we're not confusing terminology because strong and weak only applies to induction. Oh, in we inductive, sorry. Oh, okay. So in inductively weak, you weak. say? Well, is yeah. it weak? Because if most cars have radios, most means most, you know? So that would actually seem to imply that the conclusion is probably true. Um, I would look at it and think it's inductively strong. But if what you were saying was that in deductive terms, it's invalid, yes, it's deductively invalid. Because just because most cars have a radio, that does not guarantee that everyone does. You understand? So maybe I, I, I think maybe that's what you're trying to go for, perhaps. Yeah, I got the terminology mixed up. Yeah, yeah, no problem. But just to make us all on the same page, when you're giving a deductive argument where the conclusion does not have to be true, that is invalid, right? In a weird way, all inductive arguments are invalid because it's possible with induction that the conclusion is false, no matter how probable it is given the premises. So the example you gave is like two things. It's deductively invalid, but it is inductively strong, if that makes sense to you. Yeah, because if most cars have yeah, radios- Yeah, most, so it can kind of- Yeah, most makes, it, most makes it uh, likely that you have a car with a radio, but it doesn't guarantee it. So if it's probable, it's strong. But if it's not guaranteed, it's not deductive, you know? Okay, good. So um, just in terms of what we've all covered today, let me just do a couple of quick review synopsis statements. We've tried to expand on our um, in-depth knowledge of argument today by learning about the two major forms of argument and reasoning, and that is deduction on the one hand and induction on the other. Okay, so now under the heading of deduction, good deductive arguments are termed deductively valid, meaning that in the given argument, if all the premises are assumed to be true, then the conclusion would have to be true as well. Um, now, soundness means that the argument is deductively valid in form, but on top of that, the premises are really like factually true. And that just reminds you that there can be a deductively valid argument which is unsound. On the other hand, there can be a deductively valid argument which is sound. So like, all men have eight legs, Barack Obama is a man, and therefore he has eight legs, that's valid, but it's not sound. Because just discounting reality, the conclusion is a statement that follows from the premises. But it's not sound because of the totally false and weird first premise that says all men have eight legs, just totally not true. Um, now, there's inductive on the other hand, and that's what we spent some time on just now. Inductively strong argument means that if the premises are true, the conclusion is highly likely to probably be true also. So um, we've had a presidential election every four years for over 220 years of uh, American history. Well, even longer, right? 1776 till now, it's almost 250 years um, of American history. There's been an election every four years and therefore you might conclude reasonably that what? From the past to the future. So what would be the conclusion? We'll have a... We're right there, you have, you got it? Or did your mic? Sorry. Go? Sorry, go ahead. Oh, I wasn't sure if my mic was on or not. I didn't um, hear you. We'll yet. have another election in four years. Yeah, yeah, good. Well, at this point in two. But anyway, yeah, yeah. In the next cycle, uh, we will have another U.S. election. Probably we will. You know, there's never been an exception to that. 
but maybe there'd be a whole breakdown in constitutional democracy, you know, voting machines get seized and, you know, the authoritarian take over. I don't know. If that were to happen, then it would break this long historical pattern of democratic elections that we've had going for so long. So it's strong to assume that that pattern will continue. But again, I'm just reminding you about how induction can't provide an absolute guarantee of the conclusion, just something that's more probable than not. Okay, so um, you've never been shot, therefore you won't get shot today, probably won't, but you can't guarantee it. Um, your car's always started in five years you've owned it, so it'll start today, probably so, but you can't guarantee that either. So inductive arguments, they build towards a conclusion that's probable with the premises. Deductive arguments give us enough information with premises to absolutely guarantee that the conclusion would be true if they were, okay? So, um, you know, I think that's pretty much everything I wanted to work with on you guys for today. So here's the deal just for Thursday. Um, make sure that you read the selected pages in the textbook that are uh, designated for that meeting. Um, you'll see that it's pages 255 to 261, um, 265 to 268, and then also a, a short section from chapter seven, 219 to 222. Um, and that'll expand a little bit more on deduction and induction. Thursday, I'll tell you about four forms of deductively valid argument, and I'll also give you instructions on the upcoming homework assignment. That'll be due next Thursday. Okay, so if it's all good and you guys feel like you don't have leftover questions for now, then just let me know. Feel free to say bye, and I'll close the stream, and I'll um, let me say this. I'll send you the link to the Thursday meeting later today, and I'll also send you the recording of this lecture, uh, as I have done last time as well. So just keep your eyes on the um, announcements that I'll forward to the class. All right, guys, thanks so much. Thank I'll you. I have a question really oh, quick. Yeah, sure, Nancy. Thank you. Yeah, let me know. Um, when we do class in session, like in actual class, um, are you still gonna be doing recordings of the lecture as well? Yeah, no, I didn't have a plan to do that. Um, okay. I mean, I could pop open my laptop and just have it filming me and then record it for you guys. If you really wanted to, I guess I could do that. Um, then okay. I'd have a reference to look at. But at the same time, I'll tell you this, that YouTube channel that I'm sending you my videos from, it has a whole catalog of previous lectures on the same material for the same school, for the same class. So you can okay. also just find um, archived videos for the same exact lecture content from prior semesters. Like for example, spring 2021, you'll see me lecturing on the same material from there. So if you want, send me an email, any individual can do that. And I'd be happy to forward you links to those things if they're helpful supplement to the lectures yeah okay cool. okay thank you sounds good all right then thank you for that question and nancy did you have a question too or did yeah I... I did sure um so for in-person classes i don't know if you already explained it but how are you going to be like doing the lectures are you going to be doing on a whiteboard a virtual whiteboard a slideshow I'm, I'm gonna be just chalk and talk standing in front of the class like in front of this whiteboard it's going to be identical to what i'm doing here there won't be any difference so the well, only difference is we'll be in the physical room together and you're just going to be looking at me writing on the board. That's it. There will be no, uh, there will be no electronic, any resources of any kind, unless I'm showing videos at class, which I might do at certain times, but um, I'm old school. I'm teaching the same way people have done for thousands of years. All this new technology. I don't know. It's not for me, but I'm good at it anyway. I, I have to be. So, you know, but does that answer your question? Um, yeah, I think I was just concerned because I don't know if like from like everybody's like seating point of view, if they're going to be able to see like the whiteboard, do you write like big? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'll write big. I mean, it's okay. been a while probably for some of us that since we've been in the classroom, but it's just like riding a bike, you'll get in there and it'll be all very familiar to you. You'll see everything clearly. I actually believe that the immersive environment, it draws your attention and focus to the lecture much better. Now, that's part of the problem with this virtual learning environment. I mean, we're all doing our best, right? But it's so easy to be distracted. Even me as a professor, you know, it's like teaching to the void when you just, you know, you're looking at a computer screen. It's not the same intense focus. When you're sitting in your room and you just have your computer open, look, we all know there's going to be other windows that you're going to look at. You're going to have your phone. You'll be like, oh, who's texting me? There's so many distractions. When you're in a classroom, you have a singular focus and we're all like in a place and time together with one mission. So it's much better for learning. But don't worry, I will make sure to provide all the best tools that I can so that you get everything out of the lecture. I'll write big, I'll write legibly, I'll repeat things. And um, you also have my lectures to refer to as supplements if you need them as well online. Okay? Thank you. Okay, thanks so much. And thanks, everybody else. I'll let you go. I don't want to keep you too late, but um, thank you so much. Does anyone have any remaining stuff, leftover questions? I'm happy to take them. If not, don't worry. Keep them on your mind, and we can answer them either 
in the next meeting or through emails. So, okay, guys, take it easy. I'll be in touch with you between now and Thursday with those links. For now, though, uh, have a great one. I'll see you soon. Okay. Thank you. Bye -bye. Okay. Thanks. <clears throat> All right, guys, just closing the YouTube version of the stream. Thank you so much once again, and I'll see you soon.